First of all, I want to thank Ryan. I want to thank the committee. And I want to thank the co-panelists, my co-panelists, as well as my colleagues at the University of Washington and our community partners across the country that have supported the work that I'll be talking about today. I also want to thank the National Institutes of Health and the National Institute, Institute on Aging for, again, supporting the research that I'll be discussing. I want to acknowledge that I've been also asked to make recommendations in terms of practice policy and research, and I want to acknowledge that these do not necessarily reflect our funding sources. And I want to thank the Hartford Foundation and the Gerontological Society of America, <clears throat> excuse me, for supporting the pilot work that initiated this research. I do have a lot of people to thank, thank you. <laughs> but what I'm talking about today is addressing caregiving across diverse LGBT communities. And these communities reflect and cut across every other community that we have talked about. LGBT older adults live in rural environments. They're of all race, races and ethnicities, and they are of all ability statuses, just to name a few. And when I'm talking, again, LGBT, that acronym often oversimplifies the population, and in fact, it might be outdated before I finish this walk talk today. <laughs> so the field is changing very quickly. And along with global aging and increasing longevity, we certainly have increasing diversity, including increasing diversity by sexuality and by gender identity. Based on population work and then data from our own um, research, we estimate that 2.4 million U.S. adults age 50 and older self-identify as L, G, B, or T, that is lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. With the increasing diversity, U.S. health priorities are also shifting. The Institute of Medicine's report was one of the first that for the first time identified LGBT people in terms of some of their incredible um, health needs. In Healthy People 2020, LGBT people are now for the first time recognized in the national health priorities. And as we all know, public policies are also undergoing very dramatic changes. We now have marriage equality in 37 states in the District of Columbia, legislation pending in every other state as well as at the U.S. Supreme Court. So this period is, is of profound change within which LGBT older adults live and caregiving occurs. Today, I'm going to be reporting some of our findings from the National Health, Aging, and Sexuality Study, Caring and Aging with Pride Over Time. This is the first longitudinal study designed to identify mechanisms associated with variability in, in health and quality of life over time among LGBT older adults and their caregivers. We utilize a dual sampling frame, partial agency list, combined with social network clustering to obtain a demographically diverse sample of 2,450 LGBT older adults, well, midlife and older, 50 years of age and older. And this sample is stratified by cohort, both baby boom and comparable size in terms of the silent generation, gender, race and ethnicity, and geographic region. It's the first large study to have multiple sites in the South across every U.S. Census di district in the U.S. And the study is benchmarked with the national, uh, with a health and retirement study and the national health interview survey. And we're harmonizing across these studies as well as within our, our own. So we're harmonizing across studies. And we're using functional, cognitive, biological, and self-report measures. In this study, in one of the first um, papers, we identified the health disparities among lesbian, gay, and bisexual midlife and older adults. And we found that they're at elevated risk of disability and mental distress, as well as some adverse health behaviors. We also found very distinct risks by subgroup, and this issue of subgroups is very important in this research. Lesbian and bisexual older women were at higher rate, had higher rates of disability than gay and bisexual men, which was surprised to us at first because of the potential influence of HIV. But we found because of cardiovascular disease and obesity that there were higher rates of disability in these communities. We also found that gay and bisexual man, men are at higher risk of HIV, poor health, and living alone. Such disparities certainly may result in, a, in heightened caregiving needs in these communities, and when we can compare LGBT caregivers to LGBT midlife and older adults who are non-caregivers, we also find significantly they're significantly more likely to have a disability 
and, and experience psychological distress. Again, placing them at potential risk for poor health outcomes. We also find resilience and many strengths across LGBT caregivers and older adults in the study. They're often involved in wellness activities and spiritual or religious activities. And we also found that when we compare LGBT caregivers to non-caregivers, they actually have higher levels of social support. And that also was a surprise to us. But we found that they're more often utilizing support networks. It's also so important that providers and others recognize the many strengths and resources of LGBT caregivers and their families, while they also balance the kinds of risks that they might face. So we wanted to look at specifically what is the capacity to care? LGBT communities have demonstrated this capacity to care in the past when we think about HIV and AIDS during that crisis. But while LGBT caregiving has much in common with caregiving in general, and we, can't, we, we, mustn't, we must keep that in mind, we also find that there's imp important aspects of care that are unique that we should need to consider. The unpaid yet important work of caregiving in general is generally provided, as has been talked about today, by spouses and by, or if they're not available, by adult children. Yet, LGBT older adults are much more likely to receive care by a friend, well, partner first or spouse, and then friend. Over a third of the caregiving in these communities are provided by friends, which I think provides us some a unique opportunity to start to understand friend caregiving for all communities. In fact, many of the demographic differences we see in this community, are the, such as fewer having children, are the same kinds of demographic, uh, demographic factors that we're finding for older adults in general, and I think that's why this research can provide us insights into aging and caregiving across populations. But we also see important gender differences in this community. Men, are much more, men in these communities are much more likely to provide care than um, men in the general community. And also Hispanics and Native Americans in particular are providing very high levels of care compared to non-Hispanic whites in these communities. And compared to heterosexuals of similar age, LGBT older adults are though much less likely to have a caregiver available to them. The, old, the majority of LGBT older adults do not have children and do, may not have biological family to support them. While the level, level of care provided by friends is very high in these communities, the friends also have shared that at times there's limits in their ability to provide care, especially when the, there's decision making required or there's issues related to cognitive impairment. And so often in these communities, many people, like all many older adults in general, but here legal planning is particularly important, but many do not have wills, durable um, powers of attorney, or advanced directives. Although biological family support may be limited, that's not to say it doesn't exist, and we have to utilize the resources of biological family, um, children, grandchildren, when they are um, available and when they're part of the family, but they also, uh, to share with us that LGBT older adults, they share that they're often expected to provide high levels of care in their biological families because they're often perceived to be more mobile or to have fewer family responsibilities. So what are the very unique risks in this community? Most LGBT older adults, excuse me, most, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me here. As I said, the Resilience, Here's, well, in terms of unmet needs, first I want to talk just about some of the risks. We find that many LGBT older adults in particular have faced adversity since they came of age when same-sex relationships and gender nonconformity were severely stigmatized and or criminalized. They report higher levels of discrimination and victimization. And they are, even when we control for age, income, and education, we see this, these elevated levels of discrimination and victimization. Also, providers may be reluctant to ask um, about sexual orientation or gender identity, and many LGBT older people themselves are reluctant to disclose, especially given that some of their experiences in the past. When we want asked one of our oldest participants, who's 95, how old were you when you first realized or considered yourself gay? His response was 15 years old. When we asked one of our respondents, and participants, how are the same man, how old were you when you told someone you were gay? His response was 90 years old. 
We also have people of the same age that have always at the same age that have always been out. So again, this idea of balancing the variety and experiences is important. But there are biases among health and human service professionals, and few providers have received training to ensure cultural competence and relevance in providing care to these communities, in these communities. And due to the past experiences of discrimination and victimization, the caregivers and older adults are less likely to seek and utilize services. 13 of the LGBT older adults report that they've been denied or received inferior care as a result of their um, perceived identities. And transgender, bisexual, and older LGBT older adults of color experienced elevated risks in health, aging, and caregiving in terms of access to appropriate services. So there are many unmet needs. Um, and what they ranked as most important are supportive and culturally responsive long-term care facilities, case management, personal care, and adult day health and in-home services. But we have recent advances in policies that we have seen. There's a federally funded national resource center on LGBT aging that provides aging and technical assistance now to support LGBT older adults and their families. We need a comprehensive approach in services, practices, training and policies, and research to address their needs. First, we must educate caregivers, family members, trainers, policy, to redefine caregiving from private duty to public value, and as part of this, to recognize the contributions and needs of LGBT caregivers. And we must ensure that the Congressional Caucus assisting caregivers today has information and resources available as they work to understand the unique needs of all caregivers, including LGBT caregivers and their families. And we need culturally relevant and appropriate training for management, direct care workers, and residents in long-term care settings. It's needed, as is training for home care workers as part of the Professional Caregiver Workforce Initiative. We need to expand caregiving support programs and educate LGBT caregivers and older adults about the services available through the National Family Caregiver Support Act and these programs, which was one of the programs that was very early and inclusive of, LG, of friends as caregivers and sought to provide support to LGBT family caregivers. But these programs are severely under-resourced. And we also need to develop tools for identifying the LGBT people and older adults that are living alone without caregiving support and promote the use of advocates if no one is available to help them. We need to provide training and education related to advanced directives for LGBT older adults and their caregivers and create opportunities, more opportunities for intergenerational support and assistance across LGBT communities. A transgender woman shared, I've had an overwhelmingly positive experience with my gender transition so far, but I would say that my primary concern about the future is with access and potential discrimination as a senior, especially when the need arises for long-term care. In terms of policy changes, Certainly, as we're advocating for the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act, we need to identify LGBT older adults and caregivers as a vulnerable population to increase the likelihood that their unique needs will be addressed and ensure the economic security of LGBT older adults and their caregivers by reviewing and modifying entitlement and need-based programs to eliminate barriers that currently exist for LGBT communities and older adults and their caregivers and again, advocate for modifications in Social Security to compensate LGBT caregivers for time spent out of the paid labor force. We also need to extend access to legal marriage in all states to ensure that their same-sex caregiving partners have legal protections and access to benefits that so do all other married caregivers. This is by state by state at this time. But what's maybe perhaps even very critical is to enact legislation that protects against discrimination based in employment, housing, and public accommodations. The, there's no such federal legislation exists, and caregivers in these communities have, have shared with us the kinds of discrimination that they have experienced. And also, amend the Family and Medical Leave Act to extend coverage beyond that by blood or marriage to support friends that are providing care. Yes. And in terms of educate research, it's important to integrate sexual orientation, gender identity, and 
um, sexual behavior measures in caregiving, health, and aging research, and to develop tailored and responsive services, and to consider using and the, expanding the reach of strategies to be able to integrate the use of technology to better support those that are a distance, those that are isolated, as well as those that are unwilling to identify in a public realm. Yes, thank you.